Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Sarab Agarwal from London, United Kingdom. Dr. Agarwal is an orthopedic surgeon based in London, UK, specializing in upper limb surgery. He moved to London in 2004, where he completed his orthopedic surgical training. He then passed his FRC auth exam in November 2012, followed by the EBOT in 2013. He's triple fellowship trained, shoulder, elbow, hands, and trauma, undertaken at the King's College Hospital in London. He's actively involved in academics and runs his own teaching course for the FRCS since 2012. He's also active in research and has done presentations at international, national, and regional levels. Presently, he's working as consultant, trauma orthopedic and epilim surgeon at the Princess Royal University Hospital attached to the King's College NHS Trust. If you've noticed, Dr. Agarwal has delivered many lectures on our channel, and today it's my great honor to bring back Saurabh Agarwal for this wonderful live program. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hitesh, uh, for your kind invitation. Uh, it is always a, a great privilege to be on your uh, site to give a lecture. Uh, we've done a few now uh, for last year, since last year. And uh, yeah, it's always nice uh, to be here delivering a lecture. And I thank you all for listening to the lecture. Uh, right, so I'm Saurabh Agarwal. I work at Princess Royal Hospital. Uh, and our topic today is going to be carpal injuries, carpal instability, and paralunate uh, injuries. So let's start with uh, carpal injuries. So we're going to talk about isolated carpal bone fractures, followed by pure ligament injuries followed by uh, mixed carpus and ligament injuries. So these are the carpal bones, which we are all aware of. Now, scaphoid is the most common bone in the carpus to get fractured. So I'm going to talk about scaphoid more than other carpal bones. So scaphoid, as we know, can be undisplaced or displaced. Undisplaced, uh, depending on the patient profile, either you can manage with plaster or early fixation. If you decide for fixation, then uh, percutaneous is better than an open approach for obvious reasons. So this is a conversation uh, you need to have with your patient. Now displaced, of course, will need fixation. And if it's a waste, it'll need a volar fixation. If it's a proximal pole, it'll need a dorsal approach. So what is displaced? Uh, so obviously in a fracture like this, this is a transcaphoid perilunate, it is displaced. It is very obvious, no marks for that. Proximal pole, any steps, any displacement that you see is considered displacement and they all need to be fixed. In a waste, however, the latest evidence in the latest journal says it should be two millimeters and above not one millimeter, two millimeters and above. So that's the definition of displacement. Then for an undisplaced fracture, big question is to fix or not to fix. Of course, more often than not, you will give a plaster and manage them non-operatively. But once in a while, you will have a young man who sort of, who works in central London and for whom time is an essence or you'll have an athlete who can't have a plaster for six weeks. So those are the patient profile where you want to have a conversation in your clinic, discuss the pros and cons for plaster versus an operative management, and then make a decision. So if you want to do a fixation, a percutaneous fixation, then what you need to tell your patient is, uh, obviously plaster doesn't have to be there for a long time. Union rate is going to be higher compared to a plaster. They don't need to come on a weekly basis for a serial check and they can return to work quicker. But then you have the points which goes against uh, fixation would be a general anesthetic. Uh, problems can happen with the surgery, like with any surgery, screws can back out, infections can happen. Uh, as it is, young healthy man, undisplaced fracture, union rate is going to be 90 to 95% even. So why go through all those risks? 
So this is the conversation you need to have with the patient. Uh, this is the conversation you need to involve in a consenting process and then decide. If patient decides for a plaster, then the question is, do you need to include the thumb or not? Now we've done studies and we know if thumb is not included and patient will obviously then will, will be moving his thumb, his or her thumb, it will have some movements at the fracture site when patient moves, moves his thumb. But that movement is not enough to cause a delayed or a non-union. So that movement is acceptable, i.e. thumb doesn't need to be included in a scaphoid cast. Then if patient wanted a surgery, then I would personally do a percutaneous fixation. And this is what I would do. Patient is going to be supine on an arm board with a tunicate. I'll see the fracture on my II images. Then I'm going to put a wire first. And I would want to put a wire from the outer upper part of the distal pole of the scaphoid. Once I'm happy with my wire, then a stab incision. Then of course you advance the wire. You check your all four views, make sure wire is centered. And then you measure with your depth gauge, measure with your depth gauge. Whatever you measure, take four millimeter less because you want some compression and you want to sink the head under the bone and then use any variable pitch screw. If fracture was displaced and you needed an open treatment, uh, then what do we do? So let's look at one or two examples. So it's an, it's an injury of young men in their second decade. It's a hyperextension injury. So very common in footballers and linesmen. Uh, because wrist goes into hyperextension or road traffic accident, people who drive motorbikes because wrist is in hyperextension. And then of course you get a CT scan because this is a case of a non-union. How? Because you can see cyst, cyst straight away implies delayed or non-union. So I did a Wohler approach. So these are some of my operative pictures. So again, for exam purposes, those of you who are taking FRCS, you will go through the consent process and the checklist and the, and the positioning and everything. And once patient is on table, this is the sort of incision you're looking for because this was a non-union, so I need a graft from distal radius. That's my tubercle. This is in line with FCR. Make two nice flaps. So your radio scapho capitate ligament is a thickening of capsule. So once you go through the half of scaphoid, if you like, you go through capsule and the ligament in one go with the knife, make two nice flaps so that at the end of the surgery, when you repair your flaps, ligament will heal up. This is me curettaging the bone. Uh, and once you have a rough idea about the gap and the size of cortical chip you will need, then from distal radius, you take lots of nice cancellous chips and a very small, thin cortical bone because we know bone will resorb and new bone will be laid down. And then next little tip is put your wire first. Check it in the four views. Your wire should be centered in the scaphoid. The reason being if you put your graft first, then start putting a wire and you need three or four attempts, then that graft can all disperse. So always wire first, keep that gap, check the x-rays, then lots of cancellous uh, chips and a very thin cortical piece followed by any variable uh, screw that you you have on your shelf. Then of course, check your x-rays. So that's your Wohler approach for a waist. Dorsal approach. So as you know, it's gonna be a, a between extensor compartment three and four. You're going to partly incise the extensor retinaculum for a scaphoid. You don't need to completely uh, go through the retinaculum, which will help in preventing bowstringing of your extensor tendons. And then uh, once you take off your capsule, uh, partly mayo flap, then you start uh, looking at the proximal pole of scaphoid. So proximal pole of scaphoid is almost in every case a centimeter distal to Lister's tubercle. And then the entry point in scaphoid will be next to the scaphoid ligament, very important. So again, if I show you my approach of one of the case, 
So this is how we'll do it. So you need a small incision, roughly two centimeters, nothing more. This is me who is uh, partly incised the retinaculum. And once I've done that, I know that's my EPL. So that's thumb area, that's little finger. You don't even see the fourth extensor compartment. So my EPL will come towards thumb. In this picture, for example, so I put a vest, EPL is hidden under the vest. You just need to incise capsule in a horizontal fashion, a mayo flap, and you start seeing the proximal pole. That's the scaphoid unit ligament. Unit will be there somewhere, that's scaphoid. And then as I palmer flex the hand, the uh, proximal pole starts looking at you. And this is the sort of entry point, very next to the scaphoid unit ligament. And again, in the picture, as I've shown, you palmer flex so that the entry point comes to you. And again, I've only included this to let you know that in a proximal pole, the final X-ray should be one year, not three months, not six months, has to be one year. Uh, otherwise, sometimes you discharge them at four months, then there's, they go back to rugby, there's a lot of movement at the fracture site, and it goes back into non-union, which can then result in slack eventually, snack, beg your pardon, SNAC. So follow one year to make sure it's all healed up and to reassure your patient. Of course, uh, X-ray is very important. Just make sure you've checked all your views. Otherwise, sometimes screws are not in the bone and we do not, we kind of, we can kind of miss it. So that's scaphoid in a sort of a nutshell. So let's look at the other carpal bones. Lunate, occasionally I would see lunate fractures. They can happen in two ways. More commonly, what I see in my practice is they are superimposed on Kinebox disease or avascular necrosis of lunate. So AVN, as we all know, as I put an MRI here, bone is, so when avascular ne necrosis happens, bone actually is not going to collapse or fragment. Fragmentation happens when revascularization occurs, osteoclasts will come. They, they want to lay down new bone now. So they resolve the bone, start laying down new bone. This is the time bone is vulnerable. And if patient is loading his hand and wrist, that's when bone collapses and fragments or fractures. So, so this is... This is an example of avascular necrosis with a superimposed secondary fracture. On the other hand, and we're going to see a bit more in perilunate actually, uh, sometimes, as I've shown here, you can have an intralunate arc. So the fracture can just go through lunate and just come out. So you can have an acute lunate fracture. Of course, again, you need a dorsal approach to fix those. Looking at other carpal uh, fractures, so sometimes rather than a base of first metacarpal, a Benes or a Rolando, you can have a trapezium body fracture, which needs to be, if it's displaced, needs to have a screw fixation. Then capitate and hamate. So you can have shear injuries, as I've shown in a CT scan here. Third, so rather than having a third metacarpal base fracture, the axial load injury and is sheared through capitate. So again, you need to go through dorsally, reduce this fracture, put some K wires to keep third metacarpal out to length. So distraction wires, then a screw from back to front. Uh, Hammett we see more commonly. So this is one of my cases where, and we've all seen those. So uh, that's fifth metacarpal, that's fourth. See how they plowed into hamet and dorsally sheared off that piece of bone. So it's a fourth, fifth carpal metacarpal joint fracture dislocation. So in terms of management, this is what I did. So why from fifth to fourth to an intact third metacarpal? So these two are distraction wires, as you can see here, to maintain the joint space. Then you go dorsally. Be aware of your dorsal cutaneous ulna nerve and then put a headless screw. Importance is to do a lot of views to make sure screw has gone into the hook of hamet. So in this view, you can clearly see it's right in the middle of the hamet. Then as I rotate and my II image on the right, this is a end on view and I know I'm in my hook of hamet because if I had, it's very easy to stray with the screw. And if I am in between Pisiform and hamet, 
obviously the screw or drill specially can damage the ulnar nerve. So, so that's how I will manage these injuries. Then of course, if these, there are undisplaced fractures to these bones, trapezium and capitate hamets, uh, including hooks, you can manage them in a splint or a plaster. Now, another little sort of note on hook of hamet. So we have spoken about how to fix those, uh, go from the dorsum, lots of II images. But if it was a chronic non-union case, irritating the ulnar nerve, then how do we excise it? So two ways. One is a Guen's canal approach. Uh, obviously, you need to know the anatomy there, ulnar nerve and artery. Preserve those and then uh, protect those rather and excise the hook. Or I would personally go through a, the carpal tunnel. So from the sort of, if you like, needle wall of carpal tunnel, if I incise uh, 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 the tissue there, I'm looking at my hook of amet. So whichever approach you decide to choose in your practice. Then of course, this is a list of fractures where you will again manage with splints or plasters. So we'll see some avulsion fractures of tricutrum. So we know at the back, the extrinsic ligaments are centered over tricutrum. So it's a capsular avulsion. Uh, Similarly, tubercles and pisiforms, they can all be managed uh, non-operatively. So this is uh, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in a brief, this is a brief sort of description of carpal bones. So let's talk about pure ligament injuries. Relevance to us in our practice, scaphoelunic ligament and unotracutral ligament. So, so we're going to talk about these two ligaments and then of course the perilunates. So intrinsic ligaments basically originate and insert from one within the carpus. So from scaphoid to lunate, lunate to tricutrum, capitate to hamet. Extrinsic ligaments, however, on the other hand, they bridge the carpal bones to the radius of metacarpals. So we, we have volar and dorsal extrinsic ligaments. So looking at the intrinsic ligaments, these are the intrinsic ligaments and scaphoelunate and lunotricutral are the ones that we normally see fix and repair. Extrinsic, on the other hand, so if we see the volar surface, they're centered over lunate and capitate. So they're coming from radius, radiolunate, ulnolunate, radioscaphocapitate, and ulnocapitate. That's where they are centered, as you can see uh, in this picture here also. These ligaments, again, are thickening of capsule. Uh, and so obviously the space between the two will be weak. That's space of Poirier. That's where lunate dislocates or tends to come out. If I see from the dorsum now, the, all these extrinsic ligaments are centered over tricutrum, hence your tricutral avulsion, capsular avulsion. There are again thickenings of capsules and uh, they are running again from the dorsum to the, of the radius to the tricutrum and from the distal row of carpus to the tricutrum as seen here. So carpal instability. So the four types that we need to know of, dissociative, which is between the carpal bones, so scaphoelunate and lunotricutral non-dissociative, which is between the carpal uh, rows, carpal instability complex, which is uh, lesser and lesser and greater arc. So your bone and ligaments, for example, transcaphoid perilunate, carpal instability adaptive, uh, which is to the, uh, the picture to the right, uh, right hand corner. Now, this is not a true instability in the carpus itself. Carpus is adapting to something happening in the radius. And very common example is in our practices, a malunited distal radius fracture. So we need important to distinguish between the four. And before I go to the ligaments, I thought I'm going to put a slide here because all this carpal work, uh, ligament repair work, uh, perilunate work, addressing your proximal pole scaphoids, hamates, capitates, it's all done from the dorsum. So I thought I'll put a dorsal approach here first. So again, a patient of mine, 
I tend to break it into three steps in my mind. So first step is my flaps. So good thick and sort of good thick skin and fat flaps so that my cutaneous radial branches and my ulnar branches go with my fat and they're protected. As I've shown a dorsal cutaneous superficial radial nerve branch with three pointed dots. So that's the first step and that's my internervous plane. Then second step is to go through retinaculum. So I will find out my EPL and then I'll take it out of its compartment. So obviously that's thumb area. So you radialize your EPL. And then if I can take you to this uh, operative picture, these are second extensor compartments, fourth extensor compartment. So subperiostally elevate them. So as you can clearly see the sheath is there around the tendons so that when we repair the retinaculum in the end, it will not tether and glide smoothly. Once I've done that, so that's my second step. Third step is to lift my capsule. So as you can see here, I've done a radial base flap and you start seeing all your carpal bones. Now at this stage, you can address any ligaments, you can address any bones, you can deal with any paralunate injury pattern and a bit digressing, you can do wrist replacements and total fusions and partial fusions. So, so dorsal approach, workhorse for any complex wrist work, and these are the three basic steps. Of course, your capsular cut and your retinacular cut, you have to cater to that particular case, as we'll see in the coming slides. So if I only have a scaphoid or a lunotriacutral ligament repair, I don't need to do such extensive dissection. I need to partly incise my retinaculum and my capsule. So coming to scaphoid ligament, again, let's see an example. So again, a hyperextension injury, rather than a fracturing scaphoid, ligament has gone, the mechanism is the same as we know. So what do we see here? So let's introduce another concept, Gilula lines. So there are three lines. The first line is going to run through the proximal pole of these three bones. The second line is going to run through the distal pole of scaphoid lunate tricutrum. And then the third line will run through the proximal pole of capitate and hamid. So these are three smooth lines with no steps. So in all these perilunate injuries, we're looking for those steps and the break in this line. So if I show you this, it's very clear. It's a scaphoid lunate. There's a big gap. Scaphoid is flexed. Now lunate, whether lunate, so lunate is looking triangular here. And of course it is extended in a scaphoid lunate, but even if lunate flexes, for example, in lunotriacutral, it'll still look triangular. So remember lunate is a half moon boat shaped and the only other shape it adapts is a triangular shape, which can be both in scaphoid lunate or lunotriacutral, whether it extends or flexes, important. And again, you can see lunate has extended, scaphoid has flexed, which is what you can see here. That's a normal scaphoid lunate angle around 45 to 60. Once it's uh, gone into DISI, and if it's more than 80 degrees, you know it's a scaphoid lunate uh, injury. So what are the goals of treatment? Of course, you don't want to have a painful instability because that will lead to or may lead to arthritis in the future. And then of course it takes around three months for your carpus, for your mid, mid carpus to start collapsing. And that's the stage you're looking at reconstructions rather than repair. So you want to intervene early. And of course you don't want a secondary arthritis in the future. Problem is early diagnosis. Why this is important is, so in a Bando scaphoid unit, we will pick up in the clinics, but if it was a subtle scaphoid unit, so for example, there's an interosseous, so intrinsic scaphoid unit ligament is gone. Extrinsic ligaments are still there, intact. Patient comes to you, you ruled out scaphoid fracture. You're not seeing a classical DC on X-rays, but there is a swelling on the dorsum of a scaphoid unit ligament. But if you do not have a high, if we do not have a high index of suspicion and we don't do clench fist views or keep an eye on those, uh, they are the ones with time there'll be attritional rupture to the extrinsic ligaments. They go into a uh, DISI pattern. And then in the next five to 10 years, some of them may go into slack. So those are difficult to pick. One little tip is to look at the relationship. Of, so as we know, in a lateral view, that's the lateral view and we magnified it here. 
you can see scaphoid sits in the lunate, if you like. Uh, so scaphoid, proximal pole, sitting into lunate. In subtle scaphoid-lunate damages, this relationship is gone. Scaphoid will tend to come out of it. So those are, so, so lateral view, relationship of these two lines are very important. And if scaphoid is slightly subluxed out, those are the ones you need to get a clench fist view or uh, uh, keep an eye on those uh, uh, sort of at some stage they will reveal. Other little uh, thing is to be aware of slack. So this is clearly a chronic injury. You can see some problem going on even in capital lunate. So I know it is at least a slack three, if not a four, which I'll know with my, uh, which I'll stage with my wrist arthroscopy. So we all know slack one is between styloid and uh, uh, distal pole. Then two is the whole scaphoid. Three will be, it goes to capitate and lunate and four is panarthritis. So, so again, yes, in my practice, I would do an open reduction and I would do k wires and I would stabilize the ligaments, which I'll show you in the coming slides. You can do a close reduction in k wires in those very few cases where your extrinsic ligament is intact. So there's no DC happening. So again, some of my operative slides. So uh, again, as I was telling you, you make, so scaphoid unit ligament rupture, nice two thick flaps to skin. Second step is retinaculum. So I'll always find my EPL, which I'm pointing with my arrow. Once I know I've incised distal one centimeter of retinaculum, I'm holding the two edges with the tooth forceps there. And then capsule, third step. Again, you don't need a big radial base flap. You only need a Mayo flap. So I've just done a little horizontal incision and then retracted it. And now you start seeing scaphoid. That's where the ligament has ruptured. That's the ligament, that's lunate, that's capitate. And you can see a clear scaphoid lunate gap. And this is me holding the scaphoid lunate ligament. Uh, which is attached to the lunate and come off from the scaphoid. And again, uh, once I've seen this, you need to joystick your, so scaphoid is flexed, lunate is extended. You need to correct the deceit, correct the orientation. So you need to joystick them. So if I show this to you, this is a video kindly lent to be my, by, by my colleague, Prof. BJ. So you can see how with these wires, so if I take you back, See how one wire, second wire, one in scaphoid, one in lunate. See how uh, the orientation can be controlled with these two wires. Now they are reduced in this position. And these two wires are what I've shown in my picture. So you need to bring them to extremes to correct the DC. Once you've done that, then life is easy. You need to put your wires from scaphoid to lunate, scaphoid to capitate, couple of anchors and close it which I'll show you much in much more detail with lunotricutral ligament. So, so let's go to lunotricutral ligament, couple of examples. So that's your lunotricutral ligament. You can see a clear gap, you can see a step, you can see gilula lines, you can see the line, the first line is disrupted. Your angle, because your lunate will flex. So your angle uh, will be less than 30 degrees. And this is the test you do. Again, treatment, only one thing to remember is because these patients don't go into slack type wrist arthritis. So delay is not that important. And if it comes to, comes to reconstruction, uh, one can use a ECU strip. So again, an example, injury of young people, males normally, either from motorbike, football injuries, goalkeepers, linesmen, but these are the people in whom their wrist goes into hyperextension. So what we see here is, uh, so if I take you to the lateral view first, the lunate is flexed. Now lunate will only flex if there's a lunotricutral ligament injury. In scaphoid lunate, it will extend as we saw before. So, and again, lunate is looking triangular. So whether it flexes or extends, this is the only posture it presumes, uh, assumes rather. And you can see there's a little step there in the gilula line. So this kind of gave, gave away 
the fact that it was lunotriacutral. And you can see scaphoid is flexed. Lunate will follow scaphoid. So lunate is also flexed, yeah, as you can see in a lateral view. Again, CT scan confirms what we've just discussed. Lunate is flexed. This has a valve from tricutrum. It's a capsular revulsion, as we discussed before. And the whole corpus is tending to fall off in the, in the volar side. Same again, these are II images. This is how I want my lunate to be sitting uh, sort of upright with a neutral orientation. Hair lunate is flexed, the whole copper seems to be falling off. So again, some of the operative pictures. So now we know we've gone through, so three steps, dorsal approach, two good flaps, protects the skin nerves. I've gone through my retinaculum, and now I have made a radial base capsular flap, so a bit more extensive dissection. Now, with my tooth forceps, I'm showing the intact scapholuminate ligament. So the scapholuminate is intact, uh, but there's a gap in the lunotriacutrum. This ligament is gone there. And if I show you in this video, and before I start it, see there's already a step in lunate and tri uh, lunate. That's lunate. That's triacutrum. So if you see reduced. And now you can see clearly the whole corpus is falling off in the front. Lunate is intact with scaphoid. See, there's a big step in lunotriacutral. Once more, reduced, dislocated. And same uh, II uh, images are mimicking what I'm, uh, what I've shown you in this, uh, in the second uh, sort of video. So let's see, if, see, it's falling off, lunate reduced, fallen off, lunate reduces. So again, uh, so now what I've done is, you can see a couple of wires there. So I have corrected my orientation with my joystick wires. You can even see a hole there. So I've done joystick, joystick, corrected my orientation. Once I was happy, two wires, one wire from tricutrum into lunate, other from tricutrum into hamet. Once I've done these wires, my copper should be stable. Let's see in the video if it is there or not. So see it moves as one and it flexes as one. Yeah, there's no uh, disparity now. There's no step between your lunate and your tricutrum. So this is what we're trying to achieve. Once I've done this, anchor in lunate, anchor in a tricutrum, stitches will come on top of capsule and I put a knot, put a knot, capsule slaps down. So this will allow those vertical uh, septas to heal again. So washing line techniques, this is what I would do for these perilunate injuries or isolated ligament injuries. We'll see washing line in a much more detail in a minute. So again, uh, uh, II images, to what I've shown in the last slide. So once I've corrected the orientation wire from tricutrum to lunate, tricutrum to hamet, I put another wire from scaphoid to capitate. I just wanted a bit more support. And once I'm happy, anchor, anchor, stitches come out on the capsule and you slap it down. So this is the washing line technique. This is the picture again, which I've been showing you. So this is what's, what's happened to this patient. These vertical ligamentous stumps have all broken. And by putting an anchor, anchor, and putting a knot on top of capsule, like here, capsule slaps down, allows these uh, vertical septas to form again. So uh, washing line technique. So another example, 45 male. Again, you can see lunate is flexing. On our, This time we did an MRI. You can see lunate is flexing. Carpus is falling off like the last case. I put this slide to show the role of arthroscopy. So I would... Uh, if it's a barn door injury, it's fine. If it's not, if it's grade four, it's fine. If it's a grade two or a three, and I'm not sure, those subtle ligament injuries, then I would put a scope in and have a look. So again, uh, if I take you on the right side, this is a view on the mid carpal joint. I put a probe in, and I'm going to, in a minute, you'll see slapping the tricutrum down. And you can see, so tricutrum, lunate, you'll see a step here. So it was a grade two stroke, grade three, let's say. And can you see? Tricutrum goes down, tricutrum goes down there, and there's a step there. 
yeah and some sort of sometimes even if it okay anyways so so that's the role of arthroscopy in those subtle injuries you can always scope it sorry guys i think it's playing up a bit Uh, okay, sorry. So if I if we go back again, so this is where we were. Sorry about the. Uh, I think there was a bit of a Wi-Fi issue. So so in this case again, I would do a dorsal approach. As I've told you, for all most of the complex work is always dorsum. So first thing is make skin flaps. It protects your skin nerves. Look at the retinaculum. Find your EPL. That's the strip. So you only need to incise, let's say a centimeter or thereabouts of your retinaculum. Once I've done that, that's all you need. A modified Mayo flap. This is the amount of capsule. In fact, you can start seeing the carpal bones there. So this is all you need, uh, a small capsule or flap. And again, once I've done that, once I'm looking at my bones, you need to put a wire to joystick the, to correct the orientation. So if you just focus on this K wire, which I'm pointing with my arrow, and as I start the video, focus on this wire. So see lunate flexes and normal orientation. And again, it flexes, carpus falls up in the front and normal orientation. So you can use this wire in a bone as a joystick for scapholunate for lunotricutral. Once I've corrected orientation, wire from tricutrum to lunate, from hamate to tricutrum, check your AP laterals. You can see lunate is pointing in the right direction. My scaphoid lunate angle is restored. Then two anchors, stitches come out of the capsule for your capsulodesis, which is your washing line technique. So same patient, I brought my stitches out. That's my capsular flap. As I put the knot knots, Capsule with slap down onto the carpus to allow those septas to heal up. Finally, that's the retinaculum strip I took off and you repair your retinaculum. So now let's go to the final part, which is your uh, perilunate injuries. So mechanism is same hyperextension. So either you get a scaphoid fracture or a scaphoid ligament tear. And then if you extend the spectrum, uh, the patient will get perilunate injuries. And this is what happens. Carpus goes at the back, then it comes back, hits lunit, and lunit comes out in the front through space of poirier. So Mayfield recognized this pattern and he gave us this classification. So we all know type one is K for lunate. Then you're four. So remember force always comes from radial styloid and travels towards ulna styloid. Uh, so scaphoid then the force goes through capital unit joint, then comes out through lunotricutral if you like. And then finally, so this is the stage when whole carpus dislocates dorsally, lunate is still sitting in the lunate fossa. And then if this forces was to travel further, it'll take off the dorsal radiocarpal ligaments and that's when the carpus goes back, hits the lunet, and it comes out in the front. So let's introduce another concept, lesser and greater arc injuries. Lesser arc, L, L for ligaments, L for lesser, is a pure ligamentous injury. Scaphoid lunet, or both. Greater arc will be ligaments plus bones, and you can have any number of patterns. Again, why treat perilunate? Same. You, you, you don't want to have, if you don't treat it in the long term, obviously you'll have instability and arthritis. In the short term, you want to relieve pressure off your median nerve. You want to take off pain and swelling. You want to help patients with their pain and swelling. Uh, principles of treatment. Yes, of course, clinical acumen, uh, because we know 20% are missed especially lateral x-ray, your best friend, as I told you, the relation between scaphoid and lunate in subtle scaphoid lunates, or otherwise to pick up bando, pari lunates and lunate. Reduce them in a &E, and then stabilize the joints and bones as we have shown before. 
So close reduction in a &E. So for example, in this perilunate dislocation, of course, you're given good relaxation and midazolam and you've got all the antagonists. Uh, thumb pressure on lunate, traction, counter traction, and then you bring the hand down uh, in a palm flexion position and the copper should come back. And it's the same maneuver you would do for a lunate dislocation also. And then of course, a plaster slab. And then uh, you get your CTs and plan for your definitive fixation, your hand and surgeons. So let's look, in, look, look at an example of a lunar dislocation. So again, for those of you who are taking exams, you can be shown x-rays like these. So this patient was referred to me by my uh, knee colleague. He was 77, he fell down, open dislocation, and he's a known diabetic in terms of his relevant past medical history. So important will be your any management, your uh, especially uh, doctors in UK, your BOA BAPROS guidelines, any management, and then your definitive management. So looking at this, uh, on a lateral, I can see this big piece of bone. So there's something happening and is this lunate? That's what I was thinking. Then when I saw PA, it's very clear. There's a big hole there and I could see this bone, lunate bone. And this piece of bone, this bone, lunate, corresponds to this, obviously. But then if I show you, uh, so lunate and lunate there. So this is, so it had extruded so ulna words actually. And this was his open injury. So obviously you take him to theaters, you wash it out, <clears throat> uh, preserve or be aware of your dorsal cutaneous ulna nerve and then do an extended carpal tunnel approach. And this is me showing space of poirea. That's where I had to reduce the lunate back. <clears throat> Other little thing to remember is, Median nerve, not so much in this case, but if lunate was to come out in front of carpal tunnel, it pushes the median nerve right to the skin. So as you cut the skin, the very structure next to skin is median nerve, which we have to be aware of. And then lots of, so of course, joystick them, correct the orientation and lots of wires, lots of wires, but let's discuss this wire, <clears throat> KY configuration. Why have I put so many wires? So if, so for luno tricuteral ligament, as we have discussed two wires, tricuterum, lunate, hamate, tricuterum. For scaphoid lunate, two wires, scaphoid capitate, scaphoid lunate. So four wires taken care of. Fifth wire for styloid, it was very comminuted. It was a mush, as you saw in the scans. And despite doing all that, this corpus was still unstable because you saw where the lunate came out. It was a very extensive soft tissue injury. So I had to put a wire from my radius into lunate to stabilize the corpus. It is this wire there, wire from radius into lunate. So, so hence so many wires. And of course he fortunately did well, no infections, wound healed up. And this is how it was looking at seven weeks when we took the wires out. And you can see lunate is pointing in the right direction. There's a bit of a scaphoid lunate gap, but given from where we started, uh, at his age, uh, and with this extensive soft tissue injury, he will tolerate this gap very well. So let's make it a bit more complex now. Uh, Transcaphoid parilunate. And as you can see, there's a scaphoid fracture there, and lunotracutral ligament is gone here. So an, an example, uh, no marks for guessing. This is a parilunate. Lunate is sitting where it belongs. Whole corpus has come back. Scaphoid is completely displaced. Uh, it's a waste fracture. And again, once you've opened it dorsally, you can see uh, the whole corpus is sitting in the front. That's your scaphoid. Uh, I've reduced it, a wire, uh, like we would do in a proximal pole. And then, of course, you put your screws, anchors, and this is me just showing all the stitches have come out on top of capsule to slap it down, a uh, washing line technique. And this is the sort of X-ray uh, that you expect to achieve. S screw in scaphoid. And for your lunotricuterals, uh, lots of wires, then anchors, uh, and your washing line technique. Another example of transcaphoid parilunate. So scaphoid fracture, very clear. 
Now, important here is uh, this little piece of bone. So for your luno tricutral ligament to go, uh, this indicates that luno tricutral ligament is gone. So luno tricutral ligament is attached here where my arrow is. And this piece of bone has avulsed the ligament. And this piece corresponds to this piece. So this piece tends to come off tricutrum. So you can see lunate tricutrum, lunate tricutrum. So if you see this avulse bone, you know your perilunate, your lunotricutral ligament is gone. Same technique as I've been saying before, uh, you put your joystick wires, correct the orientation, visi in this case, and then a wire from lunotricutrum and tricutrum hamet, screw in the scaphoid. Once you're happy, a couple of anchors for washing line technique. And you can see this view that lunotricutral joint space looks congruous. And here, lunate is pointing in the right direction. So you know your VC is corrected. So again, uh, another example, anytime uh, you see a radial styloid, uh, we have to, here is Bando, the scaphoid unit is gone. But as I've been saying, forces come from radial side to the ulnar side. So here, force came, took off the styloid, and then took off the scaphoid unit and that's where it stopped. It could have carried on and taken on lunotricutral or tricutrum or ulna styloid. So again, for those subtle scaphoid units, so in radial styloid, always look for those subtle scaphoid units. That's the only point of putting this X-ray. And again, we put in a couple of anchors and unit is pointing in the right direction once this injury has healed up. So this slide is to summarize perilunate injuries. Uh, is just to say, so if I start from the top, so forces are starting from radial styloid and it can be a lesser arc injury. So it's taken off scaphoid lunate, gone through the joint, capital lunate and taken off lunotricutral. So that's your lesser arc. Same force could have taken off styloid, scaphoid, capitate, tricutrum and ulna styloid. So it's a greater arc. Same force could have gone through scaphoid and lunate, if you like, and then taken off lunotricutral. And then if I bring your attention to this picture, and we'll talk about intralunate arc, which is number three here, same force starting from styloid could have just gone through lunate and come out. So acute lunate fracture. Same force could have just come through the radiocarpal and ulnocarpal joint, you can have a frank wrist dislocation, which is your inferior arc. And again, here is the same thing. Forces start from styloid, so radial styloid, scaphoid lunate, capital lunate joint, lunotricutral, ulna styloid. Or same force could have gone through scaphoid, capitate, hamate, tricutrum. So we can think of any number of fracture patterns. Only thing to remember is start on the radial side, side and then you can take off any bone or ligament uh, which you like. So they look uh, severe on x-rays. They are severe, they have consequences, but all of them need the same dorsal approach, same three steps. All of them need joysticks to correct the C over C and the wires and the anchors, which at least I would, this is how I would treat it in my practice. So yes, thank you very much for listening. And if I may say, I think the reason I put this here is, so if you see uh, whether lunate, so in this case, lunate is flexed and here lunate is extended, but it'll still look triangular on your x-rays. And in a normal orientation, it looks like half moon shaped. Uh, so yes, uh, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, sir, for yet another fantastic lecture from your side and uh, absolutely stunning work and really proud of you. Oh, thanks, Hitesh. Thank you. And Saurabh, you missed about the upcoming course that's going to come up. At, uh, I know. Vona, I was so late. I had forgotten to put the slide. I was late, ho gaya, Hitesh. I got no late. Uh, Saurabh, a couple of questions from our side. Yeah, sure. Uh, now, it's all basic. You just want to recap or reinforce the knowledge to the uh, residents or fellows or viewers online. One is the duration of immobilization in an acute scaphoid fracture. Suppose it is not uh, two millimeters or more, less than two millimeters, you're planned treating it conservatively. 
how do you how long do you immobilize for a vase mm. as well as for a proximal pole fracture right so roughly if it's a waste it's 6 weeks if it's a completely undisplaced waste patient is a non smoker sensible then maybe 4 weeks uh in a proximal pole 8 to 10 weeks now remember in a proximal pole in all of them i would do surgery because there's a 30% chance of non union but if you come across a patient who has lots of medical issues and doesn't want surgery or refuses to have surgery those are the ones where i would give plaster for 10 weeks and those are the ones where i would include the thumb that's the only exception so i would like to prevent even that small movement at the fracture site and if it's a proximal pole that is i mean very small displacement and you're plan to do surgery what approach do you choose so a uh, dorsal approach dorsal percutaneous oh, no for, for so for proximal pole few things one you will almost never have displacement almost second they will not uh, they will not have a collapse and a and a and a and a humback like you would see in a waist scaphoid approach is up to you you can do percutaneous with 1 cm incision how you do it is your proximal pole of scaphoid and anatomy never changes in us is exactly a centimeter distal to listus tubercle so once you know where your proximal pole of scaphoid is you can center a you can put a 1 cm incision centered over that area and you can do a percutaneous that is a percutaneous fixation i would do a 2 cm incision i feel more in control and i feel i'm not damaging any tendons or ligaments thank you sir and if you're treating conservatively you you generally put a below elbow cast in neutral position without the thumb right absolutely and is there i mean in formerly we used to talk about the cotton loader position the glass holding position is it still relevant today or is it obsolete you know it is because you're not including the thumb so it's a, it's a simple collies a slab and a cast so it's not relevant today cotton not loader no as i said in my presentation uh, if you if you not including thumb obviously patient is moving thumb all the time but with thumb movement the amount of movement that happens at the fracture site is not enough to cause it not to heal up so they've done these studies and that's how this concept of coolies uh, coolies cast came thank you sir just one last with your lecture has been pretty long so i'll just reduce the number of questions and just one last question Sure. Uh, sir, what you have mentioned that the dorsal approach to the wrist is almost like a workhorse approach, right? I mean, you treat most of the injuries with the dorsal approach to the wrist. Now, is it because when you go volar, you're concerned about the superficial palmar and the deep palmar arches? Is that the primary reason? Not really. I think volar approach will be for digressing a bit for straightforward uh, distal radius fractures. So, of course, distal radius I'll do most with volar approach. and a waist scaphoid fracture or non union yes once in a while you can do a volar approach because for luno tricuteral ligament if you want to because in a luno tricuteral volar part is stronger than the dorsal part other than that for any complex wrist work ligament work perilunate work greater arc injuries work arthrodesis work replacement work tendon transfer work proximal pole scaphoid work it's all dorsal approach so for me for any complex injuries in hand and wrist my workhorse is a dorsal has to be a dorsal approach okay so you mentioned uh, this volar distal radius fractures l lunar to tricuteral instability and uh, what about scaphoid non unions do you prefer volar or dorsal waist if you have a waist scaphoid acute fracture or non union i would do a volar approach but of course if you have a waist fracture which is part of transcaphoid perilunate because i've already opened dorsally so i will put a screw from dorsum so what i'm trying to say is from dorsum you can address any scaphoid fracture proximal pole or waist from volar approach to address proximal pole is very 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 difficult because it because even despite full extension the pole doesn't look at you so it's very hard to fix it 
Thank you, Saurabh. I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Thank you for yet another fantastic lecture. And I'm sure this is going to be useful for a lot of people all over the world. Thank you so much, Saurabh. Uh, thank you, Hitesh. Once again, it's a privilege. And thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.